Hello folks, this is John Watson joining you today from Western Colorado. We are letting our attendees in. We're at uh, 23 and counting. We're going to let others uh, come on. We, uh, we have a, a, we had quite a few people signed up and uh, we know everybody's getting connected. It's one minute past noon here in the mountain time zone. We'll just wait another minute or two. I, I will mention for those who are already on, uh, on Zoom that we'll be watching the chat window throughout. Uh, we are going to be, and I'll remind <clears throat> the panelists as well, that as we're talking, uh, if you have the opportunity to comment on any uh, chat comments that are coming in, address questions, uh, either over audio or uh, responding in the text chat, we certainly appreciate that. I'm going to wait about one more minute, maybe less, and then we will get started. All right. All right. Three, three minutes past noon here in Western Colorado. Uh, folks, thrilled to have you joining us today. Um, my name is John Watson. I'm with the Digital Learning Collaborative and the Digital Learning Annual Conference. Uh, those are both run by the small organization that uh, I run called the Evergreen Education Group. We've been studying digital, online, blended, and hybrid learning for about 20 years, uh, mostly in the K-12 uh, public education space. <clears throat> I'm joined by an all-star lineup of panelists. Uh, we've got Yuvani, who is the Chief uh, Academic Officer with StrongMind. Um, Nathan, uh, who is the principal at uh, the Village High School in uh, my home state of Colorado, up there on the Front Range. Thanks for joining us today, Nathan. Uh, Josh, who is uh, joining us from way over in the other side of the country, about as far away as you can get from Colorado over in Massachusetts, uh, as well as Tracy, uh, about halfway through the country in, uh, in Minnesota. And finally, and another one uh, from far away, uh, Melissa, uh, who is uh, with uh, Strong Mind, as well. And I think I neglected to mention while I was highlighting where you are, Tracy. Uh, Tracy runs the Wolf Creek Online High School in Minnesota. Um, before we get into our discussion with, with our panelists, I, I want to give a quick framing of uh, the ideas that we're talking about. We're also going to be uh, putting up a poll momentarily. In fact, maybe, Kels, if you're able to put up that poll while I'm giving this opening framing, that would be useful. We just wanna run this poll uh, to, to get a sense for the um, uh, which grades your district serves uh, and uh, whether or not you have been uh, <clears throat> experiencing a reduced enrollments uh, during this last year during the pandemic. And are you offering any current online hybrid, uh, in-person or multiple options at your school district. And then finally, what your role is. Uh, as we get those answers in, we will be able to use that to uh, help tailor our discussion and responses to the folks in the audience. So as you're doing that and, and putting those up, uh, answering, I, I do want to give this quick framing of the discussion that we're going to have. So today is April 15th. Uh, we're nearing the end of the school year. And uh, dare I say it, we, we might be nearing the end of the pandemic as well. Um, I, I really hesitate to make any predictions about what's going to happen over the coming weeks and months and what they're going to bring relative to, uh, to COVID-19. And there's no question that we still appear to be in this race between vaccines and COVID variants. Uh, but at the same time, with the number of vaccines that are rolling out, with schools starting to uh, return or a number of cases having returned uh, and more and more students returning to, to in-person learning, 
it does feel like the light at the end of the tunnel is getting a bit bigger and a bit stronger. At the same time, we're starting to feel like the districts that uh, we are hearing from and working with are really starting to focus on what does the summer and fall look like? We're aware of the fact that surveys that are being done of parents show that when you ask parents, are you expecting and wanting to return to what education was like pre-pandemic? Or do you want to, do you want your schools to be thinking, rethinking their educational approaches? By a wide margin, parents say, we want to rethink some different options. We know that remote learning has been difficult for a number of students and families, but we also know that there's another set of students and families who have really flourished during this time of remote learning as well. And because of that, a lot of the districts that we're aware of, and we see all sorts of surveys and media articles about this as well, lots of districts looking to offer online and hybrid options for the first time in the coming school year. The other thing we're hearing about quite a bit is the idea that in this past school year during the pandemic, most school districts saw a reduction in their student enrollment numbers there for whatever reason. And some of them have a sense for some of the reasons why, some of them were maybe a lot, uh, they saw students going to charter schools, students uh, staying home, being homeschooled, uh, going to private schools, regardless of the reasons, they've seen a reduction overall in student enrollments. And they're looking to think about how do we get some of those students back? That's why we gathered this panel of folks who have been thinking about a wide variety of issues. How do you structure a hybrid or online school to attract students in? How do you support those students who need extra levels of support to be successful in these areas? How do you think about the, the act of, of getting the word out? You know, that, that marketing and communications isn't something that all districts are naturally really good at. It's not something that they've had to think about a lot, but that's starting to change as well. So with all those questions in mind, I'm going to be putting a set of questions and issues to our panelists to talk about some of these issues, how they're seeing them, how they're addressing them from the perspectives of the folks that we have who are running three different schools, as well as the folks at Strongline who have been supporting other schools as well. Kels, I don't know if you've got the poll answers and, and are able to uh, publish them so we can see what those numbers look like. Uh, while we're doing that, I, I will again remind all the participants that we are watching the chat window. Uh, we'll be addressing questions and comments that come in. We certainly welcome your questions. We also welcome your comments. Uh, if what you're hearing is consistent with what you've experienced, love to hear that. If what you're hearing from some of us is maybe different than what you've experienced, that's even better. Tell us how maybe your experiences are a little bit different. Um, we are definitely seeing, uh, not a surprise. Uh, first of all, I'll say question one, we've got a wide range of different grade levels being served, uh, predominantly K-12 or pre-K through 12. Uh, nine in 10 saying you've had uh, either, uh, you've had students drop off the radar, not, not a surprise. We're expecting that's why you found this topic interesting. Really interesting also that uh, the different models of instruction that attendees are, uh, are implementing currently. And then finally, when we look at the different uh, roles of the folks that we have on, uh, on this discussion, uh, school and district uh, administrators, teachers and teacher leaders as well, counselors, love to see counselors on a, on a discussion like this because they're so central uh, to how students are, are making their decisions. Uh, so it seems like we're gonna have a lot of different comments that uh, we'll, we'll be able to address those different, uh, different audiences, different ideas. With that, I wanna go around to each panelist. I'm gonna start with Tracy momentarily. Uh, I, obviously I didn't give much of a background on your, on your school. So I'd love to start with um, Tracy, hear a little bit about your school, where it is, why it was started, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, we'll go to the other uh, two, we'll go to Nathan and then Josh and then uh, 
Yuvani and Melissa to talk a little bit more about how Strongmind is also working in these areas as well. With that, I'm going to go to you, Tracy. Welcome. All right. Hello. Thanks, everyone, very much for joining us today. I know April is a busy time in schools. It looks like we have a lot of administrators and teachers. So um, my school is in Minnesota. It's called Wolf Creek Online High School. We serve students in grades 9 through 12. We have about 250 students, mostly full-time students, but we also have students who are part-time and attend other Minnesota um, schools. Our most popular supplemental or part-time course is American Sign Language. We um, are always full um, to the brim with American Sign Language, kind of interesting. We have a lottery in April and we're full for next year already. So that's been really, really popular for us and something that a lot of students come to us to take online. We've had great success there. So our school is really based on an advisor or learning manager model, bringing back the unmotivated student, helping students who haven't felt a part of other school districts or charter schools. Um, we are a public charter school in Minnesota, proud to be. So we spend a lot of time working individually with students. They have individual graduation plans, making plans not just to earn credits, but what happens after that, working through an advisor or learning manager model, and really helping to re-engage students. We do some polling. And um, our data, I won't give a lot of facts and data. I think the story really is in our teachers and educators and the good work that we're doing. But about six, between 64 and 67% of our students come to us behind on credits. I mean, significantly behind, a year or two behind. So how do you re-engage those students, get them to come back to school? It was something we were doing prior to the pandemic. We are a hybrid. We have a campus where students are welcome two days a week. So COVID stopped that and really made us become more innovative and doing even things more virtually. Even though our curriculum was already online, a lot of our mental health supports were not virtual. We have mental health counselors on campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I had begged them for years to do telehealth and they were like, nope, can't do it. HIPAA, not compliant, not able to do it. What would happen if a student you know, was in harm and wasn't physically with me? So four days after the pandemic hit, now we have telehealth for mental health at Wolf Creek and we've gone up by 70% students who are using the services because they don't have to come to campus anymore. So, I mean, I think COVID has brought us some things, some information to think about some changes and I do think all of us are going to be having those conversations so I think conferences like the DLAC conference this summer and other conferences where we say what are some things that came out of this COVID-19 pandemic that we want to keep that we found out that we can have meetings virtually that we can have flexibility that we can do telehealth that some of us have been saying for a long time so definitely our students you know really based on that learning manager model we have attendance contracts where students agree to come in for attendance and a lot of personalized instruction around um, mental health services where they would get credit to go um, and see counselors and work um, through any concerns that they're having. Sometimes it's motivational concerns, sometimes family concerns, sometimes just knowing and thinking about what the next steps are really help motivate them. So we've been really happy. Um, I would say one of the main things that we implemented um, in the past year is students have felt disconnected to their teachers, the ones that were coming to campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays, disconnected to other students. So we have a virtual campus now, Monday through Thursday, from nine to two, the same hours that campus was open. We have different teachers in the virtual campus. It's like a study hall check-in. And then two times um, throughout the day from one to two, it's more of a social emotional learning time with a school counselor and they play games and and do different things in there. So our students have a lot of flexibility. Our curriculum is asynchronous. So they do not have to be in math at nine o'clock and then English at 11, social studies at 12. We think one of our claim to fame is definitely having flexibility. We have older students, students who are parents, students who are working full time, but we have a segment of our population that really wants to see other people virtually throughout the day and do those check-ins. So I know as people are really forming those questions around what will our our distance learning or hybrid model look like, I would say really think about your students and, and what they're looking for and how much flexibility they need and how much accountability they need and really take that as a scale because I think students need both and then you need to be able to flex just a little bit. 
And I think coming to webinars and things like this are great and learning from people who've been doing it a long time. So thanks for having me. Tracy, I was jotting some notes. I think you just said about a dozen things I could follow up on. It, it, it's really interesting. Uh, you, you, you touched on so many things around flexibility and supports and other areas that, that we know resonate with students, uh, especially students uh, who have uh, maybe not been successful in a more traditional school or have uh, dropped out. So I'm gonna come back to you and touch on, on some of those areas. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna go to Nathan next because uh, Nathan, uh, back in pre-pandemic times, which seemed about 100 years ago, uh, we were fortunate enough to, to visit your school. And you talked about some of the different types of students that you're working with and how many of them were not uh, enrolled in your district prior to, uh, to uh, joining your school. Can you, can you talk about that, what some of those numbers look like? Sure, and thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm the principal of Village High School in Colorado Springs. We're uh, a public school in Academy School District 20, uh, which actually includes the Air Force Academy, hence the name Academy School District. Uh, but we have a school of about 350 kids. Um, but we really uh, kind of have a unique story in the online world. We were a completely online school for about eight years. Um, and then I became principal with this vision, really of a blended program more than an online program. Uh, kind of the, the big picture belief is that the real power of online learning for us is not location. The real power of online learning for us is personalization. So we use online curriculum, uh, do asynchronous for all of our core classes, math, science, English, social studies that kids do in a competency-based self-paced system uh, with teacher support as needed. Uh, and then they actually come into our building for all of their elective experiences. Um, and our elective experiences are very engaging, wide ranging, everything from uh, foreign language. We have an ASL that Tracy mentioned um, all the way to some very unique classes. Uh, we've offered a conspiracy theories class, beekeeping. Um, we've got a weightlifting class that actually meets at, at a college weight room for kids that want a high level strength and conditioning experience. Um, so. To John's point, we, uh, when we were a fully online school, we were about 13% out of district. Uh, and then when we created a hybrid program and had kids start coming in, we jumped to about 43% out of district, um, which would really kind of be the opposite of what you would assume would happen. Um, so we actually draw students from it, uh, about a 60 mile circle, um, about 30 miles outside of our, our school. Uh, one student actually, uh, lives about an hour and 15 minutes away from us um, and really have created this environment that really our target audience are busy kids, kids that the traditional model puts unnecessary barriers, our opinion, unnecessary barriers in place for those kids, whether that be scheduling, seat time. Uh, we've got a lot of high level athletes uh, that, that, that travel. Um, we've got some actors and actresses that may be on, on set for you know, months at a time. Uh, and really try to create a flexible environment for those students to still have a great academic experience, social experience, but also uh, still be able to pursue their passion outside of school. So that's maybe the fastest I've ever talked about our school, uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of the framework. Nathan, is it accurate to say that those students that you're talking about uh, from out of district, that, that, that a subset of those are students who are geographically within the district, but maybe weren't choosing a, a district option before the village? No, so, so if you think about it, 57% of our kids were already in our district or reside in our district. Okay. Yeah. The 43% are truly wow. students that, yeah, that do not live in, in the boundaries of our school district. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And, and by the way, I saw Tracy and, and Denise both commenting on your uh, conspiracy theories course. Uh, my, my comment is I'd love to take the conspiracy theories course. What I do really need to take is the weightlifting course though. <laughs> Anything <laughs> else, maybe some cardio too. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we got a, a, a question about working with students' families. Uh, I'm gonna go to, I, I wanna finish some intro introductions of, around what MAP is doing and then uh, hear from uh, the strong mind folks and how you're working with different schools. And then we'll get to this question about philosophy about working with students' families, which is just a great, great question. But Josh, I'm gonna to go to you first. Sure, so thanks for having me. My name is Josh Charpentier. 
I'm like, oh, sorry, there's an announcement. Hold on. No, no problem, Josh. It's uh, th- 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 that's the way live it happens work, every time. Right? We do have kids in school. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> my name is Josh Chavinty. I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of Map Academy Charter School in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, we are a charter school. We were founded um, in 2017. Rachel and I started Map Academy. And I point out that we're a charter school because we didn't necessarily set out to open a charter school. We set out to solve a problem. We were district administrators for the local district working, running their alternative programs. And we could never really do enough for students who were at risk of dropping out of high school or who had already dropped out of high school. And we, we really set out on a path to solve that problem. And in the state of Massachusetts, really the only way to open a new school with the autonomies to truly flip the high school model inside out and do high school differently was to open what's called the Commonwealth Charter School. So Rachel and I took a year, we wrote the application. We were very fortunate to raise some grant funding to to truly design a high school experience that is outside the box of the traditional high school experience that we know doesn't work for so many students. Um, You know, the, the pandemic has only exacerbated the problem that those of us who work with students who have dropped out of high school or who are at risk of dropping out of high school, but this isn't a problem that was created by a pandemic. There's been a massive amount of kids walking away from high school even before the pandemic. So I think one bright spot of the pandemic is actually shining the light on even more kids are now walking away from high school, um, either before a high school diploma or ill-prepared for life after high school. So what we do at MAP Academy is I mean, we have a competency-based asynchronous approach to high school, truly trying to meet the needs of stu- each individual student. We have uh, full-time social workers on staff at MAP Academy. I saw in the chat, tra- I think the social workers are the heart of MAP Academy. We couldn't do our work without our social workers. Um, you know, we, we were, I, I hate to say we were doing blended asynchronous learning before blended asynchronous learning became the norm with COVID-19. But I believe that, you know, we do offer online um, asynchronous classes, but they're not pre-packaged online asynchronous classes. We have the teacher generated teacher content and they're adaptable to our student population. We also offer um, seminar classes, which are very similar to what Charity and Nathan mentioned with the weightlifting and the conspiracy, things like that really, um, we try to have our teachers teach what they're passionate about. So it goes on to the students. And I mean, our bread and butter is our social emotional support, which I agree with you, Tracy, has been, you know, one of those things that we've really had to truly rethink how we do that. I'm, I'm thankful that now we're back in person because it does, it, it helps with that. But, you know, in the, in the middle, of, in the height of COVID-19, doing that telehealth was crucial. Thank and you, we John. serve and, and we draw kids from 34 different towns in the surrounding area because there's really no when, there's no when, options yeah when, when, when when we come back to you i, I, I want to hear i want to hear your story about why you're called the map academy but we'll we'll we'll, sure. we'll, come, we'll come back to that uh All right. you 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 uh mentioned the idea that map academy was doing uh hybrid and, and online uh, before before the pandemic and remote learning was a thing. And I'm, I'm going to pick up this theme with Yovani because uh, Yovani, you and Strongmind have been thinking about hybrid learning for a while as well. Can you can you talk about that journey? Thanks. <clears throat> thank you, John. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. And thank you for allowing me to join. Um, Strong Mind started out as a uh, providing education technology and digital curriculum to fully virtual schools, and that is a solution that only a, a small percentage of students and teachers um, are interested in doing. There's that social aspect of school that is so important, and so and so we knew that there was a need. And there had to have been a middle ground between a fully virtual program that does provide this uh, much needed refuge for many students, but then also a need for um, 
more social support and more student engagement. So we visited schools across the country and we really got to know all of the different um, models and blended programs and they're incredibly, incredibly diverse. Students go to blended schools for many, many reasons. Some, like Nathan had said, were, are going because of a need to balance their other, their other responsibilities, whether it's career, whether it's family. Others go because um, they, they have tried virtual school and they really need more support, but they also need the flexibility. And so StrongMind set out to understand all these diverse needs not just of the students, but also of the communities and also the teachers. And we set out to build a structure or a model that would be flexible across those various settings. And so we really wanted, um, we really wanted to help hybrid schools be sustainable in, in an industry, whether or not COVID exists, but help hybrid schools be sustainable because what we observed was, was a lot of rock star and heroic uh, educators like Nathan and Josh and Tracy, but those are those are the exception, not the rule. So we wanted to uh, scale that model so that there would be more opportunities for students and teachers to be able to engage in uh, a way that support that takes technology and allows it to be uh, allows it to be a structure and a crutch, but not necessarily the be all end all of the school and allows teachers to really um, engage with students and be able to see themselves in and outside of the digital platform and really puts that relationship between teacher and student first. Yvonne, you, you went uh, in, into this issue of using technology to bolster relationships, and, and we're going to return to that as well. I realize I'm saying we're going to return to something after every con, but we've got like three hours of conversation now teed up. Uh, but uh, but before we get to all that, uh, and, and by the way, I will say we are going to end on time, so don't. I'm not actually going to keep droning on for three hours. Uh, as much as I would like to, I could share a lot of time with all of you. Melissa, I'm going to go to you uh, to see. Uh, we, we, we've heard a lot of great opening ideas. Would you like to reflect on any of them? Yeah, I mean, this is an amazing group and uh, thanks for having me and letting me join. It's uh, it's always just so exciting to have conversations um, in this in this space and not only talk about where it's been but and where we are, but but where the future is going to take us, right? And um, so, so it's a really exciting time. And Yvonne talked a lot about uh, what kind of services and products that we have? Well, mostly products that we've built specially to help teachers and students, and and, and it's really exciting. We also so we spend a lot of time on the service aspect of really talking to districts, help wanting to add value to their current situation, help them solve their problems, whatever those are, and and it's a variety of problems. And and you can tell from this diverse group, um, every every situation is different, and every community is different. So we we really help in the whole planning and problem solving issue, which is a great honor to be able to work with people and trying to help their kids and their teachers. And uh, so we, we, besides our products and services, we really enjoy that piece of it, of helping start new, pro, uh, new programs and implementations. We're also helping people evaluate what they're doing currently and see if we can help them improve those situations. So um, it's a great honor to be here and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. So, so thanks for letting me join. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Uh, so. Uh, we, we got in this, this really good question about what's your philosophy for working with students' families? What boundaries and sports do you use? Um, uh, Tracy gave, gave a, a great answer in the chat window. I want to put this question to both Nathan and Josh as well. You're, you're both coming at this from slightly different student populations, right? So Nathan, I'm going to start with you. What, what does that look like at, at the village? Yeah, so our, so our philosophy here is uh, pretty unique in that we try to operate like an adult workplace as much as we possibly can. So if you were to see our building, we actually bought an old bank corporate office uh, and our students operate as if they are working uh, in a tech company. We've got a, an area set up, a student union with ping pong table, foosball, what you would see in an employee break room, and then uh, some breakout spaces, things like that. So our philosophy really is around that student as worker, that student being put in an adult-like situation. Um, and so our parents really kind of understand that that is our philosophy. Uh, and then we include them as a partner in that. So uh, I used to say in, in the other school I worked in, you had parents on one side and school on the other. Uh, and here, what we really try to do is, is partner together. We, we all actually all have the same goal, which is for your student to be successful 
and let's help navigate together what that success is going to look like and the tools in place. Um, but really what it comes down to is, is really strategic conversations around what is it that that student needs and how can we help uh, get there. We also use an advisory model. We call it a mentor model where every student picks an adult who's their person. Um, they get pulled into every conversation involving that student. Um, and really kind of take some ownership around that student as well. And that's an important piece. But we want to prepare students for the adult workplace and the adult world. So we kind of frame our school that it's adult practice. It's a place to make mistakes. Um, I'm an old coach. I wanted my kids to make mistakes in practice and learn from those so they didn't make them in a competition. And we really try to have that framework, make some mistakes here. You're going to mess up managing your time. You're going to get behind on your work. That's okay. What are the strategies you need to get past that? Um, and then again, bring parents into that conversation. We don't need to freak out when that mistake is made, but instead use it as a learning opportunity to grow from. So that's kind of the big picture here. You know, when we think about uh, high school as preparation for post-secondary for those students who go on to post-secondary, it's notable that something approaching, not quite, but approaching 40% of all uh, college and university students are, are going to be taking at least one online course in their career. A and the, I know quite a few university professors and they talk about the differences that they see. It, it, there's, there's really division. They're getting more students now who have that comfort level with that level of student agency, that level of self-directedness. And, uh, you know, as an employer myself, that's what we look for in, in, in highly valued employees, right? And, and colleagues as well. You want people who are doing all these things and places like your school, Nathan, do exactly that. And if I could just jump in quickly, I, I think there's a disconnect when in most schools, we structure kids that their week, you know, 35 hours of their week are structured. They're there seven days uh, or seven hours a day, five days a week, we structure them 35 hours. And then they go to the college level and a full load is 15 hours. But what do we do with the other 20 hours? Well, so our belief is we should give kids practice in the 20 hours. What, how do they spend their time? Do they work best in the morning, at night, weekends? What, what does it mean to have a mid, uh, an open period in the middle of the day? Do I use that to mess around? Do I use that to work? And so uh, we really are trying to kind of bridge that gap from the adult world and even the college level and pull it down into the high school experience as much as we can. And in the world of work, having shifted to a lot of remote as well, uh, that's it, it's even a different world outside of college as well. Josh, I want to go to you. Back to this question about uh, um, working with students' families, because I, I imagine it might be a bit of a different uh, answer from you. And uh, I'd also love to hear your, your quick story about why it's called MAP Academy. Sure. So definitely a different uh, experience with family engagement at MAP Academy. And MAP Academy serves students who have completed eighth grade through the age of 24. So we have quite a large age range here at MAP Academy. And uh, from a data standpoint, it is about a 50-50 split of over 18 and under 18. So once, for those of us who work with high school students, once a student gets to the age of 18, it's sort of like a rite of passage for that student, particularly the student population that we work with. So the over 18 students, we work directly with them as, as they are adults. Um, the under 18 student population, we try to work with the families as much as we can when it, when it will be helpful, which is an important caveat because at some point in time, it isn't always helpful to involve the, the family because the students that we serve have struggled with school for so long that they don't trust the educational system so that we have to rebuild that trust before we can truly make um, progress with the student. Now, it, obviously, if, if we need to have conversations with families, we do, but we try as much as we can, like Nathan, to work with the student to gain that trust so that they begin to trust people at MAP Academy. And it's a, you know, just quickly, like you said, John, the story of MAP Academy and why we're called MAP Academy is because we do truly view every single student and family like family at MAP Academy. Because when we started MAP Academy, Rachel and I literally took a physical map of the town of Plymouth 
and put a dot for every student. We, we were district administrators at the time. So we had access to the data of students who had dropped out of high school in the previous four years, students who were enrolled in one of our alternative programs and students who in Massachusetts, we have this thing called the early warning indicator system, which is eerily accurate that can crunch data and see if a, what a student's risk is of not graduating from high school. And when we took all those dots on a sticky on a little sticky note and put it on a physical map, there was 398 dots. And to us, those dots weren't just dots on a map. They were real students and families who didn't really, didn't want to drop out of high school, but the traditional, um, the traditional system didn't work for them. And I see a comment in the, the ch and that's where Map Academy came from. So Map hanging in the lobby, Map Academy. Um, and I see a comment in the chat about what do you do when, students don't get the lesson. One of the most unique things about MAP Academy is you can't fail a class at MAP Academy. So you, there is no failing. It might take you a little longer to finish a class and it might take the person sitting next to you. But that notion of what happens when they move on to the next lesson is often why kids drop out in the first place because when, it, when it, the rest of the class moves on to the next lesson and then the next lesson and then the next lesson. And if you're the student who's still on the first lesson, it's it's extremely hard to to play catch up in that model. So using an asynchronous approach and not being able to fail is really the technique that we use to avoid that remediation trap. We're not constantly trying to catch up with the lesson, but instead we're adapting to the individual student's personal needs where the teacher takes on the role of a facilitator or a coach more than standing up in front of the room and in our young experience, again, we're only a three-year-old school, but in our young experience, particularly for the student population that we serve, our students are getting much more individual attention, much more individual instruction than they would if they were in a mainstream traditional high school sitting in the back of the room, getting a D minus and moving on. So did that answer it? Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and if I'm showing any questioning or frustration is like, again, I've got a bunch of things I want to follow up on and I'm going to because you're actually, uh, uh, there's a memory I have of a, of a school in Chicago I visited years and years ago. And I tell that story in a, in a minute, but it's a little bit off track from this uh, question about working with families. So before I get to that, I want to go to Yuvani because uh, you and StrongMind, I believe, have been thinking about uh, family supports for elementary students in a hybrid or uh, online setting. And that's certainly very different when you're talking about, let's say, a third grader instead of a high school student. I, I'm wondering if you could talk about that a bit. Um, yes, thank you. It, it is very different from um, supporting high schoolers or older students when you're talking about much younger much younger students, much younger families who might be dipping their toe into uh, hybrid or virtual learning for the first time. And so in our in our approach to building parental supports for K5, we really look at the parents and the families as partners in the education and as partners in the uh, of the teachers of the formal teacher because they're the ones who are actively there with their students. So what we've done is we've built in supports, we've built in engagement tools, not just for the <clears throat> not just for students but for families as well. So that way we can help guide them. Um, oftentimes, what you'll see. Uh, and I think it's funny because Josh had mentioned sometimes too much help is not good is not great either. Um, oftentimes, what you'll see with uh, families is that that not knowing how to help, so helping a little too much, where the student is not necessarily engaging with the content and the learning themselves fully. And so we've had to coach parents and develop tools that would allow them to understand how to navigate different lessons, how to navigate different ways to allow their student that healthy struggle that happens from learning, from learning anything. On the flip side, when you're dealing with six through 12, um, with the six through 12 population and teachers, someone has mentioned um, wanting to um, understand how to move teachers away from that stage on the stage model where there's not necessarily that overabundance set of help. There's more of a disconnect. And so what we've also tried to do, not where we've developed supports for parents, we've also developed supports for teachers. So rather than disconnecting the learning experience for teachers and students, for teachers, 
um, from what the students are learning online, we've tried to build a support for them so that teachers can inject themselves into the online material and figure out ways to choose to support the standards and objectives that student is learning online through data, through different uh, teacher supports, through a, through a very scaffolded uh, curriculum where you have five different ways to teach the same concepts that doesn't allow that doesn't require a teacher to go out and lesson plan five different ways to provide instruction and the same so this instruction is consistent and the support is going to the right partner in the learning process yeah all all great points and and uh i i i like i like the way that that again similar to what you were talking about before the way that technology supports relationships the technology supports teachers they're there continue to be these themes. I, I think sometimes in, in some some of the media uh, are around the idea that online and hybrid schools are trying to replace relationships with technology, and that's just so far from the truth. And I, and I think we just can't say that enough. Um, Tracy, I know, I know we may be uh, losing you over audio uh, in in a few minutes to uh, to your or not your, uh, <laughs> to somebody else's uh, tornado drill. <laughs> so um, I, I wonder if you could address the question about diverse learners that came into the chat with me. Yeah, yeah, it is severe awareness week in Minnesota. So we're having the statewide tornado drill soon, but yeah, I for me, I just think we have a lesson template and a template that we go back to with high school students. We have, you know, a curriculum that is laid out and I know you know, we haven't really focused on curriculum and lesson planning here because we think some of the first steps are those relationships and welcoming students back who may have been disconnected. But obviously a huge piece of the curriculum organization, curriculum planning for any students of any background is just consistency, starting out and really thinking about how you're going to form those lessons, what pieces you're gonna purchase, how you're gonna partner with people. We've heard a lot from Strong Mind today, you know, about the research and development there. I think with COVID, especially in Minnesota, we've heard a lot of schools wanting to move to more virtual options next fall and kind of just getting, you know, the first one out the door and getting their program up and running. But I would caution people to really take time to look at each of those pieces and to start out with those universal design models and really looking at the ways that you can partner with other people who have done it well, other companies who have done it well. And I think for us, that's really been important for us that students know in the same place in each course where to find the teacher contact information, who they get in touch with, who they need to talk with, who, what they need to do. And I think looking at those cultural pieces has been you know, very important for us. Um, in, in the area in which we live and ensuring that the situations, examples that we're using are relating to our students and you know that they're pieces that they're able to relate to, their families are able to relate to, and they don't feel like they're being judged and in any way. A lot of our families um, you know, are living in poverty and it it's you know, strange in some ways that they're picking virtual learning, choosing virtual learning, but they feel it's leveling the playing field for them. And the examples that we're using need to align with their experiences as well. So I think we do a lot of professional development with our teachers to ensure that. So those would be some of my thoughts as the things that we've worked with, but love the other things I've heard too. So thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. And I know that uh, I, I'm gonna assume that you may have sirens blaring in the background uh, and uh, just DM me if, uh, if you're able to be back on audio. Um, there was, uh, and, and as she just mentioned in there, she's gonna stay on chat. So thank you, um, Tracy, for doing that. I, I also wanna mention a, a, a point uh, that was raised, a question that was raised about how do you move instructors from the stage on the stage model? And, and I know we've, uh, some of the panelists have touched on that, but th this actually, for, for folks from a mainstream district, this is a really central issue. And, and we've had a lot of discussions with different districts that are thinking about their first online or first uh, hybrid schools starting up in the fall. And, and what we see is it really takes an effort to create a free standing new school or program. And the districts that are able to, in some form or fashion, choose the teachers 
in, in a competitive selection process to, to go to be the teachers in that school, I, I would argue is absolutely central because it is a different approach. There are many teachers who love it. There are a few who don't. And the idea that you're gonna take a teacher who is not really comfortable uh, or not liking that approach and uh, make that, uh, and in a sense, almost for not maybe not almost force that different type of teaching approach uh, on a teacher who's not welcoming to it it's just not going to go well and, and so what we see with with all three of Tracy Josh and, and Nathan are are essentially start up schools and that's what we've seen and then and then further than that we've seen also the idea that once you've got if you're in a district once you've got that online or hybrid school then you can start to take some of those ideas and bring them across to the district in a variety of different ways. And, and we've seen that done uh, very successfully. I, I do wanna go uh, to Melissa uh, because as Josh, you, you were talking about a couple of things about the way that you started the school and, and that actively looking at the map and the story about the name Map Academy. I, I, as you were talking, I was recalling uh, a, a school that years ago I, I visited in inner city Chicago that had a similar Similar approach, not necessarily with the physical map, but the idea of we know there are students who have dropped out or at, are at risk of dropping out and we are going to go find them. And they were doing things like going to job fairs, going to other events, one, I mean, walking around outside and chatting with people, young people who maybe looked like they could have been in school or should have been in school and weren't. So I'm just thinking about these very active efforts. And, and it feels like for a lot of, a lot of, districts, that may or may not be something that they're really comfortable with. And um, Melissa, I know you and Strong might have been thinking about this quite a bit. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, it, what does that look like for how you work with districts? Yeah, um, it, it's really interesting because we've been working with uh, school districts for a long time to help them recruit uh, new students and, and build this ideal persona, this ideal student persona and family persona that they're trying to attract to their school. But now with this pandemic and all these lost students, it's taking on a whole different meaning, right? And we're really having to evolve with that. So we use a variety of methods to help schools really um, to reach their lost students. We, we help them tell their compelling stories, right? What are your good stories that we need to get out to, to your families and to your students in the area? How do we get them back in? We use a variety of digital uh, marketing tools right now and some traditionals, but we really help drive awareness for their programs to increase their enrollment and capture these kids back into their schools. We also will help them build community. We use a variety of um, tools for that and, um, and, and, and it all around public relations, storytelling, telling their story and just really getting interest back, right? And then once we get the kids back and help or, or the, just helping retain the other students that are already in the district, we continue to have parent engagement tools. Giovanni talked a lot about the tools within the curriculum that engage students and families. And, um, and so it's really, it's a multi-dimensional um, approach, right? But uh, the exciting part is really helping schools. You guys, you guys all have your own stories, right? And uh, we, we wanna help you tell your stories either through digital marketing or helping you with your website or a variety of ways that we can do that. But, um, and, and helping if you can put a student story and student success story that, that actually reaches out to other students and, and gets them in the heart. Um, that's how I always say, this is a heart business, right? I, I love talking to all the coaches too, because uh, that's uh, how we, a lot of teachers are coaches at heart. So, um, but our job is just to really add, add resources to help you tell your story, get people excited and help build communication tools for, for you. Excellent, thank you, Melissa. Uh, Jay Scott in the chat window asked a, a really good question. Uh, I, I'm gonna, um, well, I see that Josh has addressed it. Nathan, I might go to you and see if you have anything to add over audio momentarily. I will mention it's uh, 10 minutes to the top of the hour. So we are drawing close to uh, the end of our time. Uh, so I mentioned that to all the attendees, if you've got any uh, final questions or comments uh, to, uh, to get in, please do so. And I'll remind the panelists that we're gonna do a lightning round in a, in a few minutes. And so I'm gonna be looking for the, the final uh, 30 second closing that you want to leave everybody with. Um, Nathan, I, I want to go back to you momentarily uh, about this question that Jay Scott asked. Um, traditional content achievement, still core, uh, but are there 
additional uh, areas that you're thinking about as well that, uh, th that you want to uh, impart to students, whether uh, Tracy mentioned executive function, uh, Jay in the question talked about habits of mind, complex reasoning. How do you think about that, that, uh, those issues at the village? So uh, I, content, our belief is content is only as important as the skills that it teaches. So if, if your content is not directly tied or if you don't pull out of your content, those skills that students are gonna need beyond high school. Uh, one of the things I like to ask parents when they come in and meet with me is, how much of your high school experience do you use on a daily basis? It's, it's very little other than the skills piece. Well, I, I, I learned to get along with other people. I, I learned how to learn. Um, we don't actually use a lot of the content. So to us, content is that vehicle to teach those skills. Uh, and one of my favorite conversations to have is, is what is the purpose of school? Because that really unpacks those skills when we can unpack and, and, and figure out what those purposes are. Here we joke that our, the purpose of school here is to raise a generation of kids that don't live in their parents' basement. Well, what skills does it take to not live in your parents' basement? Like, let's unpack that. Well, you got to be independent. You, you need to be able to, to read. Uh, you need to be able to take care of yourself. And so then let's use the content then to drive those skills is really kind of the, uh, the big push that we have here. Uh, all great points. And I don't know if you, if you notice that you got uh, one accolade at, at, at mentioned in the chat window and probably a, a lot more as well. And, and you know, I, I, I just 100% agree with you around all that as well. Um, Josh, I wonder if you have anything to add. I'm, I'm, the, the chat window is getting busy, so I don't know if I'm missing anything, but Josh, do you have anything to add on, on the, well, this variety of topics that we're talking about? Uh, sure, I mean, we use the, we, this is definitely a growth area of ours, like I put in the chat, but we are trying to formalize how we can assess social emotional learning. We are basing that all off of the castle competencies because we think that in the research that the castle competencies are on the cutting edge of what students should have as far as those mindset skills go. Right now, it, it really lives in, in Google Sheets. We're working on building out a data platform to house all of that, but it, it lives in a Google Sheet that each, indul, each individual student has that I could share a template without a student's name on it if anybody wants to see it. Um, and it basically just breaks down the castle competencies and allows the students to self-assess themselves in how they are with those castle competencies. And there's also a spot for the counselor, the social, school social workers to talk about how they might improve with those um, social emotional competencies. Again, huge growth area of us, but a huge focus as we grow as an organization, because we think it's um, incredibly helpful that our students learn those skills and they should they should be, they should earn high school credits related to those skills too. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Josh. Well, we are at um, six minutes to the top of the hour. Most people uh, these days seem to run from one Zoom meeting to the next. So we're, we're gonna do our lightning round closing and uh, we will, uh, and if we, we may ideally even end a couple minutes early, give people uh, like three minutes before their next meeting. Uh, I'm gonna start with Yuvani momentarily then, uh, Melissa, uh, and we will uh, just final 30 seconds. What would you like to uh, our attendees to walk away uh, from this great discussion with? Yvonne, you're up first. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, in 30 seconds, everyone here is absolutely correct. Those relationships between teachers and students, education and students matter, and those are the things that keep them engaged. Those are things that are most important. But we can't forget that in today's day and age, we need to meet the students where they are. The, there are a lot of principles from adult learning that apply to students today in terms of relevancy, in terms of engagement, and and how are these skills, skills going to matter? And so. In that regard, content can be a really, really important and powerful engagement tool. And it is it is king for students today. So in that regard, uh, it can be a partner and it can be very, very powerful, a powerful tool for teachers and schools to be able to rely on as they are competing for students' attention with everything else that's going on out there in the world that makes 
school not as appealing and not as um, not as traditional as it was when we attended 30, 40, 10 years ago. I like the way you looked at me when you said 40. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Yamani. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, you're up. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone again for uh, all their great input today. It, uh, it's always uh, just a great honor to be able to partner and collaborate with people and, and talk about these real world problems that we're all trying to help with. So um, we, we love that. If there's anything we can do to help anyone, um, add, we would love to add value to your students and to your schools and teachers. Strong Mind really has as really student and teacher focused and um, and building tools to to really allow your teachers to continue to focus on things that are important, such as relationship building and those things. You guys know your students best, but if we can add value, we would uh, love to be a partner with you or help in any way we can. So thanks for having us today. Thank you, Melissa. Josh, going to go to you for a next lightning round closing. So, uh, I, I guess what I would leave with is particularly for the administrators uh on here that i think now is the time to to change educational models i mean it does work for 80 percent of students maybe 85 percent of students but when you take 15 percent of this entire student population who it's not working for that's a massive amount of kids and i think if there's a point in history where real change in education can be made it's right now with an incredible influx of money from the federal government and real change can happen particularly for the students that need it most as we get out of this pandemic. Fantastic. Totally, totally, totally agree. Uh, Tracy, are, are, are you done with the uh, tornado sirens? Yes, we are all good. So I would just quickly say, I think it has been amazing. So thanks everyone for taking the time. And I think the questions in the chat, we could talk about for hours and hours. So please keep asking those questions, reaching out for resources as you walk down this path and um, always keep you know kids in the forefront and you'll do great so thanks everyone so much for your time today thank you tracy and uh nathan going to you last yeah so i one of the things that frustrates me is that in this conversation uh when folks are are starting new programs and moving we we've taken what we've done is we've taken teaching and moved it online and my encouragement is to think about moving learning online. Our students learn all day long, every day, sometimes the things we want them to learn and sometimes the things that we don't want them to learn, but they spend all day long learning. And so we need to shape our school around learning. And so you asked the question before, John, how do we move away from Sage on the stage? And, and my instant reaction is we take away the stage. Um, and in, <laughs> when, we, when we look at only 15% of people are auditory learners, but yet most instruction is delivered that way. So instead, let's move the learning online and then let's free our teachers up to build deep and meaningful relationships with our students. Uh, and then we'll learn together collaboratively. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, folks, we are at the top of the hour. We've got contact information up, up there. I did, after Tracy said we could talk for hours, I said, hey, we're going to continue this conversation for hours at the DLAC uh, conference and StrongMind is a sponsor of that. So I put that in the chat window. Uh, with that, I'm gonna say thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to, to all the attendees. Thank you for all the great chat comments, uh, signing off from Western Colorado and hope to see you all again soon. Thanks very much.